Good evening once again. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. You may be watching this at three in the morning, for all I know. Oh, you may be you may be watching it in, in out in the open. It's really funny to think about how my videos might be seen and heard, in, you know, from people who are, who are around the world, assuming anybody is watching this. Um, and around the world is something I want to talk about. I want to talk to you today about the whole business of Islam. And I don't want to do it in the normal sense I would. I'm not going to give you a history of Islam. I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, if you want to learn about Islam as a religious concept, can I suggest that you have a, a good look at, at many erudite and, and interesting documents and videos and so on you can find on the internet which explain this, the, you know, the pillars of Islam, the concepts of Islam, the Arabic terminology that goes with it and so on and so forth. Um, I, I don't want to talk about that. I, what I, you know, you can read that somewhere else. And I'm also not doing it because I, I, I think there are better people than me to do it. It will be kind of a bit, not offensive exactly, but a bit undermining my position if I suddenly decided in my wisdom that I could uh, lecture on the subject, especially since I'm not of that faith. I was brought up a Roman Catholic. I am now what you might call a lapsed Catholic. Yes, I know the Pope is looking at me right now with a disappointed look in his eyes. Well, Francis, you're just going to put up with that. And uh, my particular view about the whole process of religion is something I will talk about a little bit and then I will talk afterwards about uh, my uh, view of, of Islam. I, I, in order to do this I need to introduce you distantly to a friend of mine whom I value a great deal and who has played a large part in my understanding of how Islam operates and that's my friend uh, Mrs. Rania Hafez who I met during my time as president of the Institute for Learning and who is now a close friend of mine and whom I have spent many a happy hour uh, chatting about stuff not much about Islam from enough uh, but certainly about all sorts of other things in relation to the world, about politics and education and so on. And uh, I know Rania is a, uh, she is a, 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 a what my, I suppose, in the north of England we would call a staunch Muslim, uh, and she certainly is a, a loyal Muslim and, uh, a, a, you know, engages with the, uh, with the feast days and, and practices of Islam. And I, and I have learned not so much about the content of Islam itself, but to gain an insight into Islam as a practice, and Islam as a philosophy, and Islam as a social order of things from her, which I am deeply grateful for. She has given me a sense of moderation, which I probably didn't have before that, which in some ways has helped a great deal. Uh, in order to understand that, you have to understand what I used to be like a few years ago, probably before I met her. Good um, few years before I met her. I mean, as a, as a lapsed Catholic, my view of religion was highly critical, to say the least. I was a determined atheist. Uh, and determined atheist in the sense that I, found, I was oppositional to, to religion. Uh, oppositional in the sense that I felt it was a stain upon the body politics of society. And that we should attempt to, as a civilized world, expunge it at all costs. You probably guessed from that statement that I don't feel that these days. Uh, and there is a good reason for that. And, I, and I, I, it's probably because I'm getting older. And I, that doesn't mean I'm doing it because I'm doing a Pascal wager and hedging my bets, bets against death. What I'm doing it for is as I've got older, I've started to see that there's more to the religious experience than just the business of dogma. And, and, and it's meddling in the political sense of the word. And also the secondary kind of media-driven evaluations of religion, which often can end up interpreting it in, in all the wrong lights. I have become, in the process of, of years, not so much an atheist as what I refer to as an agnostic. An agnostic is someone who is not an agnostic. An agnostic is, to a certain extent, a fence-sitter. Someone who says, well, I don't believe in God, but I don't know, really. And I, you know, I'm not into that. I, I don't believe that's a really sort of like brave position to hold, 
let's get some sort of commitment here. I'm, from an analytic point of view, I've sort of come to the conclusion that uh, my understanding of religion is based upon ignorance. I'm waiting for someone to convince me, and so far I have not had any convincing arguments. So, I like Socrates, like probably some of my other great philosophers, I can look at religion and religious practice and religious experience with a certain degree of peaceful equanimity without necessarily having to, uh, to have any commitment to belief or otherwise. I do not persecute religion. I do not feel it's, it's a bad thing in the world, nor do I think at the end of the day it's something I necessarily can grasp in the sense of my ignorance. Being an agnostic is not the same as being an agnostic. Being an agnostic is someone who says, Nobody has told me what God is and how it's defined. Therefore, how at the end of the day can I come to any understanding of the practices within your religious life and religious, your religious universe? Having said all that, I can now go on to talk about Islam from the point of view of my experience in, in, in over the past few, past few years. My particular view about all this has been coloured very much in a negative sense of the word, by the extreme hostility that's grown up in society about Muslims and Islamic practice. And the extreme hostility has come out of the events well, since 9-11, you know, when suddenly Islam became the most hated of religions around the world, where being a Muslim became threatening almost, where sitting on a public transport wearing a hijab or you know, having a beard and looking slightly warm was grounds for people to shun you and to feel you were a threat to their very lives. And this, it seemed pretty obvious to me from the very outset that this particular process was a kind of overreaction to events. After all, you know, the, 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 it's often been said about politics that the, you know, the, the, the actions of a small number of people can blacken an entire political movement. In the same way, the actions of a small number of Christians or a small number of, 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 of Jews or a small number of, of, of uh, uh, Muslims can blacken an entire religion. And I think it's wrong of us to judge Islam on the basis of the actions of organizations such as ISIS or Al-Qaeda or whatever the case may be, which are very much concerned with the business of a particular form of, of radicalism, which is in reaction to events which to a certain extent we created. I'll come to that in a minute. Having said that, said that, I still believe that religion has its own critical responsibilities within the world. It is necessary within any religious experience. In fact, any kind of structured thought process to have some sort of critique of the way one behaves morally and, and, and judgmentally and so on and so forth. But without that critique, there really isn't any moral thinking or ethical thinking, or sorry, that I should say ethical thinking at all, out of which morality can, can come. After all, if there is no ethical thinking, then any dogmatic statement about how one lives within the world is equally valid as opposed to any other dogmatic statement. Having a religious book, in the end of the day, does not guarantee the morality of a particular religion, because all religions seem to have religious books of one sort or another. Which ones are valid? Well, if I was an atheist, I would say you pays their money and takes your choice. However, having said that, I still believe at the end of the day there is some value from religious experience in the way in which religious books reflect the being of religious experience within the world, and especially moral experience within the world. And one can gain some insights into the, into the way morality may or may not act through that very process. So there is a sense that religion has its value, it's just not the value it thinks it has. If I was growing up in a, as a Catholic, one of the key, curious things about all that is I tended to be grow up in a society where Catholics were seen as almost all-knowing. You know, God had told us exactly the way the world was supposed to be. We were the right ones. Everybody else was wrong, especially Protestants. <laughs> that is a joke, by the way. And that at the end of the day, um, end of the day, we were, as you might say. The, 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 the chosen few of society's uh, moral and, and religious vanguard. Uh, complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. I mean, you know, anybody with, a, with two thoughts to rub together would probably work out that that's not entirely the case. One may uh, might aspire to kind of virtues within the, within the, within the Catholic system of, of, of morality, but there's a lot within the Catholic system of 
morality which one can disagree with about things like treatment of homosexuals, treatment of transgender people like myself, treatment of women, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, birth control, la, 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 la. even down to fundamentals such as the business of the way in which we, the, 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 the firmly and, and intransigently religious would engage with things like society and the social order. Um, so there is a sense that without a critique, religion loses in time or moral function. It becomes less and less that. What is interesting about Islam is that Islam has built into it its own sense of moral function and critique. Muslims are encouraged to, in dialogue with their imams and with each other, to go through the process of engagement about that. And in a sense, some respects, respects, they have more in common with Judaism than they have with Catholicism, which is more dogmatic in its, in its, in its belief system. Islam is, to a certain extent, a, 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 an inquisitive religion. It has adopted itself and adapted itself to the changing order of society, but still retains something of its foundational concepts about the whole business of how the world functions. So there are key issues with Islam I find really valuable. One of them, for instance, is the, the idea of the Ummah. Ummah is the idea of the global Islamic community, the idea that there is such and such, such a thing as a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a sense of common value between Muslims all over the planet, irrespective of their colour, their gender, their height, <laughs> yeah, irrespective of who they are and their wealth or otherwise. There is a common sense of, in, of being one community. What happens to one Muslim matters to other Muslims across the planet. And I think this is grossly misunderstood especially by other organizations, social societies, functions of society, and other religions that don't have that sense. Now people will say to me, well, surely the Catholic Church has got that same sense of one universal and apostolic Catholic Church. But no, it does not. It does not have that same sense that all Catholics are equal. Because I know for a fact that in, in, in the Catholic Church, some Catholics are more equal than others. It depends, particularly in, in, in terms of your your structure within the hierarchy of the system where that where that function where that function operates. But let me pass on smoothly from that. Into the business of the Ummah matters a great deal. And understanding the concept of the Ummah as a global uh, a, a, a Muslim community also indicates something about concepts within Islamic practice which are important in that context. So the idea for instance of of tithing, for instance, and of giving to the poor. The idea that it's the Muslim's responsibility as a function of being a Muslim to do charitable works. This is largely obscured and, and, and you know, uh, uh, un, un, you know not conceived of, but in any society which has Muslims in it, there are millions upon millions upon millions of dollars or pounds or yen or whatever it happens to be that are passed on into society for the good works and support of poorer Muslims within society. And, funnily enough, quite often, Poor non poor non Muslims as well, as we've often discovered, for instance, in, in times of crises, Muslims have come out of, of, of you know, their, their social groups and provided structural support for a broad, mess, broad number of people within society as a, as a means of supporting people when crisis occurs. This is important because it's part and parcel of Islamic belief. This is something which you could say also exists in Christian belief except how often is it practiced other than through the function of what you might call options to charity, where we have to be appealed to all the time on TV by celebrities to touch our hearts sufficiently that we will give a few pounds. And of course that process of touching your heart ups the ante of emotional appeal every time it has to happen to the point, till it comes to the point where you just despair of emotional exhaustion about being appealed to for the needy in society. For a Muslim, this is a fundamental aspect of the world. Giving to the poor is part and parcel of that. And we can't emphasize that. I can't emphasize that too much, how important that really is. Muslims are also supposed to go on the Hajj. They're supposed to go to the holy places in, 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 in the Middle East. Uh, or, or sometimes during their lifetime, uh, you're excused. This is, I find, find this really useful. You're excused. If you're if you're poor can't can't do it, or if you, you're not mobile and can't do it, you know if you're someone who's badly disabled and can't can't make that trip, you're, st you're still excused from that. In other words, it's compulsory, but it's not compulsory for absolutely everybody who can't do it. And I find that 
reassuring and intelligent. You often think of the same thing in the light of Catholicism. Catholicism often wants people to walk there on their knees. Catholicism seems to like suffering as a means of exhibiting some sort of fundamental <laughs> obeisance to God's love. I don't think that's what Allah asks Muslims to do. Allah doesn't ask Muslims to do that kind of whipping, as you might say. I suppose mortification is possible in certain uh, Muslim sects, but you know it's not fundamental to the religion, and I think uh, those sorts of processes are often taken out of context in the way in which Islam is, is identified. Another aspect of all this, and I think the one that, that explains something I was talking about earlier on, namely the business of the reaction of Muslims to events, and especially the violent reaction of Muslims, is that one, because of the global ummah, because of the nature of caring with Islam, within the Islamic community, because Allah commands it, that this should happen. And because of the nature of, of Islam as a obedience to the will of Allah, that there is a necessity for Muslims to respond when other Muslims are in under threat, under oppression, in a state of dire need. Now that's an international obligation. It's not something that simply occurs within a country. Christian countries can, in all honesty, ignore other race Christian countries if they feel economically fitted to do so. But in Islam, this is not really possible. Umar desires that Muslims support and look after each other, especially when they're under the threat of violence, oppression, death, and so on and so forth. So it's not surprising to discover that when you get circumstances such as military operations within the Middle East that may threaten Islamic countries or threaten Muslims in one way or another, that many Muslims across the world, especially those living in Western worlds, you know, you know um, privileged communities, find themselves in a ethical quandary, wondering what they're supposed to do about a situation where their brother Muslims and sister Muslims are being seriously threatened, threatened, and especially by governments to which they find, to which they see a lack of moral fiber in the way in which they operate within the world. To a certain extent, Islam is like a mirror that shows up our pragmatic incapacity to make decisions which have a thought through ethical process. And in that sense, Islam points fingers at us and says, as white pseudo or Christian communities of one sort or another, you have to live up to your values. If you don't live up to your values, then the chances are we will not respect you. And if we're not respecting you, you become less than, or in a sense, capable of making moral judgments upon us. And that process, I think, doesn't excuse doesn't excuse the murderers of 9/11 or the people who blew up buses, blew up bombs on buses in, in London, and in, in, you know that fateful month of July. All the other events that have occurred where Muslims have been blamed, it doesn't excuse those things, but it gives a hint as to why violent reaction and the taking of those lives became almost the only reaction that was left. It has been said and by many thinkers down through the ages, not just those Islamic ones, but by many, many thinkers, that uh, violence is the last refuge of those who have no other option. And those particular systems have been shown time and time again to be avoidable if there are other options available. And I think one of the biggest issues has been is there is a certain sense of racism within the Middle East that's encouraged the idea that local Arab societies are of not really of very much value and therefore can be easily exploited for the West's own profitable outcomes. Whether that be about you know, stabilising their own geopolitical position within between in that part of the world or about exploiting resources such as oil for instance. That sounds brutal but I think it's worthwhile considering and worthwhile confronting. Can I end by saying I'm not here as an apologist for Islam. I'm not here as someone who's going to make excuses for terrorism. I'm not here to say that everyone who's a Muslim 
is a nice person uh, because people are not necessarily nice irrespective of their religious beliefs as I have discovered on a great many of occasions what I have discovered is it's possible to have Islamic values which have a great deal of great deal to teach the Western world in terms of community in terms of charity in the terms of the disciplines of day-to-day -day life which I think are valuable with, is, as not to, for us to adopt but for us as lessons in how we might organize society which is far more equitable far more associative and far more um, um, about the value, value of human beings in their, in their own sense. In a, in a way Islam is about doing something that Emmanuel Kant already was talking about back in the late 18th century and that was this business of treating human beings as ends and not means and I think if you can think of some of the best as aspects of Islam as being about that treating human beings as, as ends and not means you're probably on a good way to understanding what my message here is about. I hope you find this interesting especially if you're a Muslim yourself and sat through all this Please don't shoot me for getting and misinterpreting certain aspects of Islam. This is my take on it. It is not gospel. It is not doctrine. It is not dogma. This is an assimilation of philosophy, sociology, politics, and my understanding of some basic concepts. I hope that, in a sense, is its own value. And with that, goodbye.